Thanks, Lee. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for this session on putting users at the heart of your website as part of this digital week from uh, SuccessFlow. So I'm Nathan Vision B2B Marketing and Training, and I'm sitting in Manchester in the UK today. I work with businesses to improve their profile and reach, especially in some hard-to-convert industrial engineering, manufacturing, scientific, and professional services markets. Uh, and as you've just heard, there, we're going to be covering a lot of ground in this session today, but the slides are going to be made available, I think, next week as well. And there are some additional materials, including some um, full chapters from our uh, Smart Insights Brilliant B2B Digital Marketing Guide available there in the, in the handout section. And, and, and as we've said, please do get involved in the polls today, send questions through, and we'll, and we'll look to answer some of those in the time allowed at the end. So, um, you know, uh, we, we all know who this guy is, Bill Gates, uh, and he's famous uh, for a number of things, including Microsoft, but also he's famous for making a quote about the internet and business. He said, if your business is not on the internet, then your business will be out of business. And I actually agree with Bill, and I've done for a number of years, because based on all the research into business buying that's been done, particularly in business to business markets, but consumer markets too, people now do search for and end up on supplier websites at some point during the buying process. The ability to be found and then present an informative, um, easy to use and engaging experience to all visitors when they arrive improves your chances of your business converting web traffic to uh, transaction. Of course, the skeptics amongst you will say, well, of course, this guy working in tech would say that, wouldn't he? Well, I do think he's been proven uh, to be right um, over time. In terms of the agenda today, uh, we put together a webinar that's going to cover a number of things. You know, we are specifically here to talk about user experience and how to uh, create websites that actually give customers and users what they're looking for. So we're going to look at a few things just to put some context on that that are around the area of maybe looking at things to kind of revisit and, uh, and fix on your website as it stands today. We're going to look at some key features all websites I think must have. Then we're going to look at how to put customers at the heart of your website, and we're going to be doing that by looking at five different key elements of website design, um, and that's not just the creative uh, design elements. And then we're going to be talking a little bit at the end about how we manage the briefing uh, process. I think there'll be probably some questions on managing um, partners and things at the end of that as well. So a lot to get through in the next uh, 35 minutes or so. So we've got our first poll that we want to run uh, for you now. Uh, just to get a sense of everybody on, 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 in, on the call today and uh, to what extent you consider yourself to be a webmaster in terms of somebody who looks after a website. It's a quick poll, five answers. Encouragingly, we've got an equal uh, split of uh, people who are the primary uh, um, person responsible for business websites and part of a team and then coming in just behind that, having some responsibility. So we've got about 86, 87, 88% of people on the website today that are actually um, uh, responsible for websites. That's good. We've got the right sort of crowd, hopefully for the right sort of content. Great. Thanks for your feedback there. So we'll just move back on. Okay. So uh, with websites being so important in terms of feeding the sales machine and offering such important potential return on investment data, which can help us improve our, our overall marketing. I think there are a couple of things to think about when we're setting off, either on reviewing an existing asset or in fact creating a new one. Ultimately today um, is about refining your thinking, I think, in two areas, and then deploying the right content and the technology to get and keep the attention that we're looking to achieve. So the most important questions we need to answer are, who is the website for? and what is it supposed to get them to do? Knowing your audience, um, and in marketing, obviously the classic definition of, of marketing is meeting customer needs profitably, but often we don't always know who the right customers are, we don't always know what they need, um, and we don't always make a profit. So you know, getting those three things right is pretty, pretty important, and it's magnified in the digital environment. So take some time to understand who uses your website and what information they need to make the decisions that they want to make. Digital media enables you to target broad groups, but it also allows us to micro-target as well. Now, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn, as it gives us a professional marketing audience of something like 400 million users around the world at the moment. And it's a fantastic resource for customer and uh, influencer research. You can very easily get a sense of the issues audiences have by their individual um, uh, role, company profile updates, but also then the questions and the discussions that they're having in places like LinkedIn groups and in other places around the web as well. 
And this can help us both uh, in terms of developing content to engage them, but also shows um, the questions that we must answer if we're going to hope to convert them to being a customer. And this, this, of course, I think is really important to how we structure websites. So going into the market and getting a real good crystal clear understanding of what audiences want and what they're looking for, problems they need to solve, is going to really help us in terms of presenting ourselves back as the solution providers in these instances. And this really takes us into an area of creating uh, persona clusters, um, and I think this is really important to me. And we're not talking about kind of, you know, uh, consumer um, profiling necessarily. So in, in the sort of markets I work in, um, we're working in complicated sectors with lots of different influences and decision makers all having a say on particular, um, you know, purchasing uh, decisions. So we've got to uh, influence a lot of different people. It requires delicate handling. So I've kind of happened across this uh, uh, PASS model, this PAS model, um, and sort of adapted it a little bit. But basically, what it's about is it's about understanding who it is that um, we need to influence and understand, you know, the the pain point, the you know, the, you know, the problem, the challenge that's keeping them up at night, you know, that's affecting their ability to do their job well, or. And I say or because there could also be an aspirational element to it. So we're looking at people in roles here, not just. Um, you know, faceless organization. So there's either somebody with a pain or somebody with a desire or an aspiration to improve something. We can then present ourselves in a way primarily through our websites because that's where we're going to be um, found first um, to offer the sorts of solutions and things that these people are looking for. The word switch is on there in all of these scenarios because, you know, often we have to uh, make a presentation against an existing supplier or an existing um, uh, partner, so we're going to have to think very carefully about how we manage things like objection handling and how we position against other people's or the company's claims. And ultimately, we want to make an appeal, so we want to link very clearly the appeal of working with us and certain buying our products and services, and how they're going to take that pain away or deliver that aspiration to these particular people we're targeting. So all of this is important as a kind of a tee up to what we're going to talk about in terms of user experience throughout this webinar, because we need to understand who the users are and what they're looking for in order to deliver the right experience. So we're now going to look at some uh, reasons and some things to think about in terms of reviewing the website today. So there are a number of um, uh, things in here which you know we, you might want to go away and have a look at as a result of uh, uh, sitting on some, some of the webinars. So we're going to take them in twos. So um, on, on this first slide, we're looking at are you open for business? Um, so basically, you know, when a website market research company Netcraft last ran a survey of live websites uh, in 2014-15, it found that there were approximately 919 million live websites. Now, that's a lot of competition, um, you know, for us all as businesses to kind of come up against. And that's really the objective online. It's about fighting for attention. It's about fighting for that attention and trying to keep that attention for as long as possible. And as part of that, we need to tell a story quickly and confidently. So we've got a number of reasons here for why we should invest in websites really before we do anything else. And this is the, the, the sort of guiding proposition of the, the B2B uh, brilliant digital marketing book that we did for Smart Insights. And we've run it out into version three in April, just gone. And the premise of the book is setting the strategy, getting the website right, then before you spend a single penny on anything like search engine optimization, inbound content marketing, social media, advertising, email, marketing automation, all of these great, great tools and great techniques, but we've got to have a website that when people land on it, they get it and they, um, you know, and they can see what it's about and it meets their needs because all the money spent in the world on all the activity designed to drive traffic to that website, the website doesn't hit the mark when people get there, all that money's wasted. So the website's really important to this. And having a website creates a home on the web, as we know, and it gives us a home base, which we can direct all that other activity to. And it's actually the only part of our digital marketing arsenal that we really can truly own and manage and manage the story on. A lot of the other things are, once they're pushed out into the market, into the world on, online, you know, they are at the mercy of the people that are interacting and engaging with them. So in terms of your website, does it do and say what it should and what it promises? And then secondly, a specific website strategy aimed at putting the right information in front of the right people when they want it will focus all of your resource and your time and your money on where people land and conveying a positive and expected first impression so that's the focus so all of this is talking about being open for business 
In terms of uh, being accessible then, so, um, you know, we've, we, uh, we talk about uh, providing contact points online. So how many of you on the call today offer a phone number or an email address? And this isn't an info address or a sales address, it's an email address for somebody, for a human being who's going to manage that customer when they get in touch. Or live talk, perhaps, you know, live talk and live chat functions, you know, uh, were, were all the rage about 10 or 15 years ago. They kind of died a death a bit, and now they're, they're coming back in, a bit, you know, in terms of a bit more of a resurgence. You know, and all these tools are designed to start a conversation, because for me, that's got to be better than giving somebody a form, you know, presenting a faceless organization that people can't interact with and asking everybody to fill in a form that promises to get back to them within 24 hours. Because if you do that, guess what? Those customers want an answer now. You've lost them. They're going to go and get that answer from somebody else. Fourth thing, obviously, a website's working 24 hours, seven days a week as your primary salesperson. The best websites do that. And this is where you may have decided to add the forms so that you can at least catch those inquiries, but you do need to have the other elements in place too. And have you established when people are buying? It could actually be evenings and weekends. How are you going to catch this business? Do you need to operate shifts to manage on-site support, especially if you're running e-commerce operations and online Q&A across website and also on social too? So what impact does it have if you're going to be a truly, you know, 24-7 business? Again, these are all things that we should be thinking about in terms of how our site's operating right now. Getting some really juicy stuff now. So in terms of benefit, are you selling features or are you selling benefit? So OVP, what does that stand for? This comes from Dave Chaffee's um, uh, e-marketing excellence. is the online value proposition. So what is the reason for being for your website and for the service it's offering? Is it in providing information to catch browsers, to convert interested parties, or maybe both? Is it helping save time and money by maybe moving some you know, self-selection services onto the website rather than through a phone number? Is it to reduce waste or improve productivity, increase output? You know, so what are, what are the objectives? You know, what, what are the things that are going to you know, give you an edge over your, over your com competition? And what are you ultimately providing to your customers? So that then manifests itself in content. So what visitors having to click all over the place, including potentially leaving your website to access other content, it's probably best to ensure that all content downloads, video and social, and everything else embedded in your website. Because what that does is it makes your website sticky, keeps people there longer. So that longer dwell time, you know, statistically has an impact on people taking the right sort of actions on the website if they stay around it long enough. So then the seventh and eighth point in this sort of look at the website now and seeing what, what, what objectively what we can do to improve it. So we're looking at a laser focused approach to digital marketing. So the seventh point is about um, when it comes to really spending on digital marketing, having a focused website that is doing very specific things for very specific audiences also has tangible benefits to improving the search engine optimization of the site. So all content is attuned to the right topics. So more pages talking about the same things, which is then amplified across social media and trade and business media too, doesn't forget them, can boost your messaging and your positioning on those topics and on those keywords significantly. So it's about having a focus. And what that means too is that we can run dedicated campaigns. So as visitors land on specific landing pages within the site designed to help them meet challenges, they can offer an expert insight, then they're more likely to share their contact details and we're getting into having conversations and conversions as an expert and trusted part as opposed to just a transactional supplier. And talk a little bit more about that as we move through the webinar. And then finally, because we're marketers that like to see the impact and the benefit of what we do, we need to make sure that all we're doing, uh, we, can, we can track the um, track the performance and look to improve where we feel we need to. So in terms of improvement, you know, we can set some goals in analytics. And the great thing about Google Analytics um, is that, you know, even just using the standard um, view, there's a huge amount of tracking opportunities available that uncover user interaction with content. So we can decide which content is more relevant or which content isn't by, you know, number of views and number of interactions and how much time has been spent on particular pages. And from a content perspective, that means that we do more of the stuff that works and less of the stuff that doesn't. So we're refining all the time. We can look at referral data from search, from email, from social media. We can look at where in the world or where in the country regionally people are coming from. 
and what devices they're using too. And the device stuff's particularly useful if we're still running websites that perhaps aren't um, you know, responsive or adaptive in terms of being able to bend and flex depending on the device being used. And if you're looking at website traffic of you know, upwards of 15, 20% from mobile or tablet devices and you're still not responsive, you know, it's a conversation you need to be, you need to be having within the business. So all of these things can um, give us goals that we can set that we can use to improve site experience and then also the performance of our website and our digital marketing um, as well. And then in terms of testing, having a website strategy and dedicated focus means that we're constantly testing, we're trying different content, we're trying different campaigns, we're trying different keyword um, combinations and things, we're constantly testing and, 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 and evolving in line with customer expectations and feedback. So, you know, your website isn't an Argos catalog, you don't just, you know, fix it up, print it, ship it once a year or, or whatever, this is is a living, breathing um, asset that it needs, you know, it's, it's like your garden, it needs careful nurturing over the time, you know, over the time, season to season to season. <clears throat> so hopefully some things in there just to get you sort of uh, warmed up and thinking about how well your site's performing at the minute and maybe some things to go away and just, just, just think about putting in place. So we're going to move on to six key features a business website must have. And some of these, you know, have come up in the context before, but, um, you know, we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail now. So um, in terms of validation, so and in honesty and integrity, and the first thing to say is that information has to be easy to verify and that, that you need to demonstrate that there's a real organization behind your website. When we talk about verifying information, we take this to mean being able to, you know, understand that the company is trustworthy, that it's stable, that we're able to contact the company. We know where it is. It has a physical address. Um, we can confirm its legal status. These are all telltale signs. And websites that don't give this sort of information, you know, should be websites that we potentially run a mile from. And if you can't find these things, you know, especially on transactional sites, we do indeed need to proceed with caution. And there is evidence that, <clears throat> that the organization exists, takes this further by providing clear guidance on things like different divisions, different departments, multi-site operations, you know, maybe starting to think about personality, you know, positioning of key people, talking about sort of roles and responsibilities, customer feedback, case studies and testimonials, all of these sorts of things, you know, will help to validate that this business does exactly what it says it does um, on its website. <clears throat> Second thing um, in, in this in this area is to demonstrate honesty and integrity. And we do this by focusing on some of that expert content and the services offered. So as we move from being a broadcast to a targeted inbound marketing economy, companies that produce focused content relevant to the needs of customers will stand out more. And this has positive effects on getting found in the first place and becoming a first port of call for customers. So we look at UPS here as an example, International Freight Courier. They stand out from the competition by being a little bit more personable. You know, and this just comes across in the images. You know, this, the website homepage is reasonably stripped back. You know, most people come to the website, they're either making a booking or they're tracking a parcel that's currently in transit somewhere. You know, some people might be interested in the share price and, you know, quotes and costs and other people might be interested in um, things like the London Olympics. Admittedly, this uh, this graphic is a few uh, few years old now, but but still, uh, the, the, the homepage still looks the same, you know, more or less in terms of navigation site structure. Um, yes, yes, yes. So we see a lot of things in here in terms of expert services, customer focused content right to the homepage. These qualities may be seen as subjective, but you can set a tone throughout your website with pages like About Us, Our Philosophy, FAQs are brilliant. Think about the questions that your um, sales team get asked on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and if you could catch them and write blog posts about all the things you get asked all the time, then when people go to the web looking to find answers for those sorts of questions, who's going to come up first? This is where we're getting into being optimized for the right sort of search for our you know, for our customers and prospects. And they also allude to your honesty and integrity because experts give a little back before they look to transact. And the final thing on this, uh, on this slide is about making it easy to contact you. Uh, admittedly, we can't see a very large uh, telephone number here on the UPS website, bad UPS. Uh, but we talked about contact points above uh, from a ver verification perspective. Um, well, actually, contact details should be clearly signposted on every page throughout the website, not just on a contact us page. 
this starts to get us into the heart of considering each and every page as a potential landing page for our, our new visitors because you know now people can land on our website from any page so we need to think about how we move people along from being aware to being interested to having a desire and to taking an action the classic uh, ADA sales model and applying that to our website to uh, design and design and configuration so offering a range of contact options increases the likelihood of customers getting in touch make the phone number prominent we're still often frustrated when sites don't have the number prominent for example it's often hidden in about us or on a contact page so again a few things to think about there and then thinking about all the things to do with navigation and, and, and sort of broad broad content as well so your website should be accessible and easy to navigate there's a reason why websites developed in the west are generally structured broadly the same with navigation bars either running horizontally across the top and the bottom of the page or vertically down the left hand side and occasionally now we're starting to see some use of um, uh, you know sort of boxes and panels around uh, around the right hand side as well um, but you know it's, it's it's a standard way people look to navigate through sites now so make sure you follow this rule as the majority of internet users expect websites to look something like this um, and it plays into the uh, the mindset of different browsers some people will click on the big uh, um, high impact image some people will want to browse around and click on little call to actions some people will go chronologically across the navigation at the top or down the navigation at the side so we want to make it as easy as possible for all different types of people to come to our site and, and access the content because if you don't you know if you fail to comply you know it risks alienating visitors which leaves you with a higher than usual bounce rate which isn't necessarily something that we want it's also uh, part and parcel of this of this area to use frequently updated and relevant content and and, and and content is the biggest part of a digital strategy I would say as it governs selection of keywords what you say how you say it and where you say it so websites that offer frequently updates to pages that can be subscribed to such as news and blog pages and other pages ensure customers keep coming back for more Oliver valves here who are a northwest uh, manufacturer of valves that go into uh, process and oil and gas and, and, and other applications uh, have to some extent broken from the norm in providing a blog and a variety of news-based RSS feeds and perhaps more importantly it keeps the search engine bots indexing the website for keywords that you're using which maintains a higher visibility in search engine results so over the last 10 years we've actually seen some guidance uh, fluctuate on the use of promotional content so back in the early 2000s the advice was to play down promotional content but now though it's advisable and in fact desirable to serve up content to customers that requires them to part with data in order to receive it the website browsers are now much more switched on to exchanging their contact data in exchange for you know well-written advice and counsel and expert opinion on particular products and problems that they're looking to solve and that will aid them in their, in their roles and then finally we obviously want to make sure that there's no errors so it sounds obvious but spelling mistakes grammar and punctuation any slip-ups you know 404 messages if somebody arrives on a page that suddenly isn't there anymore the address has changed and any other errors on a website which disrupt the user experience and risk harming your credibility have to be stamped out as soon as possible because you may only get that uh, first chance to make a first impression um, I just wanted to finish this a little bit with talking about the five second test so your website offers a first impression to many visitors coming into contact with your business for the first time it needs to represent who you are and what you offer there's a chap called Jacob Nielsen that if you're into this usability stuff uh, basically wrote all the manuals on it um, and he basically said in, in some books a few years back that you only have 10 seconds to show your face to the world but I think that's probably down to three to five seconds now in 2016 and yes this means that human attention span is now officially less than that of a goldfish there's a number of reasons for that but we just don't have the time uh, to sit and wait for pages to load we don't have the time to sit and try and understand what they're about if it's what we were looking for we don't have the time to sit through long videos or read long editorials or watch a succession of advert pre-roll before video we just don't have the time or the attention span but in terms of website development you know we need to consider from the outset that first time visitors to a website are looking for assurance and credibility it needs to convey that there is a stable physical business behind the site that it is a company that they want to do business with 
can they find what they want in five seconds? So can you get them to do what you want them to do in five seconds? So the five second test is asking um, a family friend, uh, a family or a, fr or a friend, family member or a friend to go to your website, have a little click around and tell you um, what it is they think the company does or even better, give them a task. Say, I want you to try and find this particular download or this particular blog post on our website in time, how long it takes and ascertain the, ascertain the journey they take to get to that content. You might um, see some surprises there. And then you, it might um, involve some um, redevelopment work and some customer journey mapping, which we're going to talk about next. So yeah, how to put the customer experience at the heart of your website. So user experience, uh, UX design, or sometimes called CX, customer experience or user experience, are kind of mutually um, uh, used uh, in, interchangeably. But this idea of thinking um, puts um, a focus on digital interactive products, including software, applications, and websites a positive and consistent user experience that can be achieved by combining creative and functional design along with things like accessibility, usability, information architecture, and user interface design, which are all things that we're going to talk about. So it's important to recognize that user experience is a key part of business branding. The sites that signpost routes to the content different audiences are looking for helps achieve a good user experience. Now this, in turn, increases conversion rates by generating trust and encourages both loyalty from existing users and new traffic from viral referrers. So on the screen here, it's a very simple example that I sourced looking you know, at a very um, bad UX and a good UX. And you can see you know, how the, um, the, the, the more simplistic approach to the wireframe in the good UX example where there's basically less things to click. So you're making it as stripped down and as simple as possible. Um, uh, for people to get to the sort of content that they're looking for. So that's what the art of UX and CX really covers. It's about what it looks like, how it works, how I get around it, what happens on different devices, and have we planned for when things might go wrong. So we're going to talk through now five key elements of UX design. So the first one is usability design. So a usable product is one that is practical and efficient, technically. It is assessed against a criteria of a percent task completion rate and satisfaction with the completion of the tasks. So that sounds a bit complicated, but what we want to do is we want to test how easy it is, like the five second test, how easy it is to get people to do certain tasks through the website and how many steps it took and what the process of clicks was to kind of achieve that task. Because usability is about making it as easy as possible. And contrary to popular belief, usability and user experience are not necessarily the same thing because usability is just one part of the overall experience a user has when they're on a website. Usability should be considered in relation to efficiency, good harmony with the other aspects of user experience. In this regard, it's about making the site work and work quickly and helping users navigate it quickly which ultimately keeps them satisfied. So often there's talk about a three-click rule. Can you get to anything in three clicks in your website? So again, that's the sort of test that you want to take away uh, to your website. If you've got very complicated menus and sub-menus and drop-downs and it's difficult to work your way back up to the top to then go somewhere else in the site, we might need to look at simplifying that. You might want to reconstruct the site based on different types of audience that we were, like we were identifying in persona clusters maybe looking at, if you're working in the building product sector, you might be looking at specifiers, um, you know, people like, you know, architects and surveyors, you know, very specific audiences, but then looking at the users and looking at the trade of people who are going to stock it and sell it. So then what you'd say to those audiences is going to stop you having a homepage that says, are you one of these people? Click through to get to the right sort of content a little bit quicker. We see a lot of that pharmaceutical still where, you know, they're presenting information to patients, they're presenting information to, you know, healthcare providers, and they're presenting information to the guys who are running the studies um, that are putting all the data um, into, into the right sort of published magazines and things, and giving them the ability to make that is. It's about, you know, getting people to be able to do what they need to do quicker, and then that's what the usability side of things is all about. 
So Nielsen, again, in, in his book, Designing Web Usability, said that the web actually reverses the picture in product design and software design. Customers pay first and experience usability later. But on the web, users experience usability first because they're using the product, they're using the website, but then they'll pay later if they choose to transact from you. So implying that usability is more important than web design itself and that the primary role of the website is not to look nice, but to help customers perform useful tasks. Think about this as you build the structure and flow for your new or existing website. And here's a good example of a task-oriented site from uh, the UK Barclay Card business, uh, which offers simple routes through to the key pages most users visit the site to use. So there's not an awful lot of things to click here on this site. So whether you're a small business, you want to take payments, you're looking at the different kind of products there on the right-hand side. It's a very easy site to navigate and get you to where you need to get a good deal quicker than probably other financial sites. Okay, so we're going to move on to, so that's usability. That's about getting people to be able to do things quick, quicker. So then the second part of this uh, user experience and putting customers at the heart of the website is talking about information architecture. So on large websites, it's essential to consider how information is grouped and collated for the customer's benefit. And conducting exercises offline can often help identify trends in browsing behavior and provide a useful psychological insight into how different individuals search and interact with their content. And this can play into how a site's navigation is designed and displayed. So the website here for Swedish construction and project management company Skanska um, actually adopts a number of simple but effective navigation techniques that help to manage the presentation of content to site users. So in this screen grab, it's got a long home page. So I've just dropped the top half of the, of the, of the home page. And if you go and click, click Scanska, across Scanska on, uh, online, you'll see more of this. We can see the uh, navigation effectively deployed at the top, um, as well as uh, we've got sort of breadcrumb content sort of through the site there as well. So people that want to go to the navigation bar at the top, they can do that. People that want to click on the dynamic content here that's going to be scrolling through, because we can see that based on the little circles there, there's a number of top stories or top content that's going to be scrolling through there. And then we've got some areas that we can go down and kind of click into um, below, uh, which have been carefully selected um, navigation devices that help signpost effectively to deeper content. Um, the site also makes use of this carousel, as I've said, to convey key messages. The thing about information architecture and navigation is that people will give up quickly if they can't find what they want. So making sure that you're using industry standard definitions and vocabulary and not your own words um, can really help in that a lot. Um, and using colour and tabs to help people identify where they are. Side navigation bars on in the pages work quite well for this. So often if you've got a if you've got a vertical um, uh, 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 taskbar on the website and you've gone into say Skanska about us onto that page and on the about us page it might say mission values meet the team so on and so on you know one of those top one of those words then or the uh, tabs might be red to indicate to you that you're on that page and then you know if you move around the site it will kind of give you a color reference to where you are things like that can be really really useful to help people work out where they are if they've been clicking and clicking and clicking and drilling deeper especially if you go beyond a sort of three or four click rule a little bit on information architecture. So we're going to move into functional design now. So this will be an area that will be probably um, well known to most of the people on the webinar today. But functional elements that need to be catered for in the design should be considered from the outset. So in terms of the projects that I've worked on from a website perspective, we'd normally start with the site map for mapping of content. Then we'd move into um, wireframing, and then we'd move into page templates, and then you'd eventually start doing some design work. You know, I try now not to pitch for any work that involves us taking creative in, because how can you possibly um, pitch creative for website projects to clients if you don't have a real thorough understanding of who the customers are, what that customer journey is, if that journey on the existing website is broken and needs to be reconfigured. So these are the sorts of things that we need to do up front. Um, and this is functional design. So consider from the outset to both ensure that you have the relevant profile and position within the design, but not too much that it confuses the design. So the purpose of a functional um, specification like this is to outline primarily from a user's perspective all the individual elements that need to come together to deliver a great experience. So we use wireframes in website um, production as a common method for establishing which elements are required, where they should be placed, 
and the emphasis that they may take on any pages. And then that also gives us a steer on the different templates that are required for different pages within the site. So wireframes can help build a skeleton of a website and a blueprint for the content and the call to action, which come later. There's a lot of great tools, uh, free tools online when it comes to um, uh, wireframing for um, websites uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we can uh, uh, share with you um, uh, after, the, after the webinar. So use wireframes to determine the most relevant customer journeys. And we're going to talk a lot. We talk a lot about customer journeys in the chapter two download that you get as part of the handout. So make sure before you leave the webinar today that you hit the handouts button and you get the chapter two from Brilliant B2B, which is all about websites and website development. There's a lot in there about responsive and adaptive, which we're getting into today. There's a lot in there about the project management, which we're not getting into on the website today on, on the webinar today. Um, so yeah, make sure you get, make sure you download that as well. So then looking into the creative design area, so there's five little bits uh, in this in this creative design area that I wanted to um, talk about on the webinar today. So the first thing is templates. So from a layout structure, you know, you might have three or four different page layouts uh, for most B2B websites. You'll have the home page, you'll have a content page, which might be a news or a story or a blog or a product page, some words and pictures and guidance on bullet points and things and so on, and then maybe some uh, uh, form pages, you know, um, contact forms and things. So for example, your home page will have a different layout from a landing page for a pay-per-click pay campaign. And you'll know when you've clicked through from something on Facebook or LinkedIn or a Google AdWord when you land on a landing page because it always talk, it talks about, you know, the the awesomeness of the product that you've landed on, particularly if it's within, you know, marketing training or marketing automation. You know, there will be guides around, you know, you're going to download this brilliant free guide. It's going to tell you these six things and how to do this better and so on and so on. They're, they're written in a way that get you to fill in the form, give you the contact details in, in relation to what's being offered. So very, very different sort of page. <clears throat> keep the elements in these layouts can constant though, so this will help keep the visitors from feeling like they're lost. The templates are important. Um, secondly, careful use of colour. So avoid using all sorts of colours. Maybe focus on uh, anywhere between two and four colours that are consistent with your brand for the templates and for the call to action buttons and things. And often you'll find on websites that you know, orange buttons set on blue websites work quite well as there's to green buttons as well. So generally orange and green are used for action buttons because most business brands are probably blue, probably process blue. Um, so those sorts of colors stand out quite well. Third, I want to talk a little bit about animations, gadgets, and other rich media. So the key word here is to avoid anything unnecessary. So using flash animations because they look cool is the wrong strategy. In most cases, it's best not to use animated backgrounds, background music, you know, videos that start up with people kind of talking about, you know, the company and things every time somebody lands on a page. So only use rich media to help support content and information. You know, and this is covered in, in, in sections again in, 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 the, in the expanded guide that if people email me after the webinar, I can get you a copy of the expanded 250 page guide. But carousels are often used in business sites to convey propositions and promotions. So here we've got some examples of Acer and Dell and how they do it slightly differently in terms of how they present their core um, offers on their website. Interestingly, at the point of taking these screen grabs, Acer was quite uh, static, whereas Dell quite dynamic. Um, running sort of you know three or four different messages through its home page at that particular time, and the detail is in separate tabs locked away through the site, and it, it makes it effective and efficient in promoting different customer pathways. So, some thoughts on creative design. Uh, we're still, whoops, gone forward a little bit there. So, um, in terms of um, contingency. Um, we are talking about um, there will always be situations where a user makes a request that the system is unable to answer or performs an action that goes against how the system was designed to work. So leaving form fields blank, um, requesting a page that doesn't exist, making a spelling mistake when performing a search, or trying to buy a product that is out of stock are all examples of how users could challenge your website's ability to do its job. So by predicting some of these challenges and proposing solutions to either preventing them or dealing with them when they happen by thinking about what if questions, again, as part of this whole design and user experience process, is it possible to find solutions that add value and maintain a positive user experience? I think you can. You know, here's an example of Lego's 404 error message. 
it, it displays when you click a page that isn't there anymore or, 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 the, or they can't find it. Now, I've seen lots of examples of 404 pages that then you can add a link to say back to home page, go back to the blog, back to news or fill in a contact form, get in touch with us, why not hit the live chat button. So whatever you're doing is somebody's gone wrong the website can't deliver what they're looking for, but you've got a second chance to do something really cool to keep them, keep them there, keep them on the hook. So make sure, have a, have a think about your 404 messages and think about, you know, how you might be able to work a bit of sort of brand narrative into that. So I think they were the sort of five or six um, um, uh, areas uh, where we start looking at user experience design. And, and there was one in there that we kind of hovered over, which was accessibility as well. So naturally making sure that websites are um, able and available and accessible to a broad number of um, customers and prospects as well. So we're going to do the second poll now based on um, some of those uh, things we've discussed. So which area of UX website design do you think you're going to be focusing more on? as a result of some of the things that you've heard in this webinar. Is it usability? Is it information architecture? Is it the functional side of things? Is it the creative side of things? Or is it that accessibility and kind of contingency uh, planning? So if you could all um, vote on that now, that'd be great. Okay, usability, not a surprise. You know, we wanna, you know, once we, you know, once we get people to the site, we wanna make sure that they get what they want quickly out of it. And it's really interesting because what that says as well is that um, you know, Jack of Nielsen writing these books, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago was right. He said, actually, websites do need to do a job and get us to the information we want quicker uh, rather than just necessarily look nice um, or necessarily, you know, you know, be, be other, other things. So it's a really interesting, um, really interesting feedback that we're all kind of in the same place. Thanks for, thanks for the feedback there. Okay, well, that's, that's kind of all I was going to talk through today. Um, we did talk about doing some work on briefing website designers, but I thought what I'd do is, in terms of the downloads there, that you've got the three downloads in that, in that section of the webinar, I've actually put, put in there a website briefing document that, um, that I've been referring to for a number of years. It's, it, 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 it's got a lot of questions in it. It's three or four pages long, so um, it is, it, it's comprehensive. You might not need to use all of it, but the idea in there is that it's about you know, having a document that manages expectations on the client webmaster side, but also if it's an internal team, the internal digital team delivering the right thing in, uh, that's going to be, you know, it's going to be doing the right thing for the business. But especially if you're working with outside suppliers and partners, design agencies, website designers, because often projects do fall down on the brief. Um, so if those briefs are as, are as comprehensive as possible, you know, so the client, the website master has put all the information in there they think they need. There's a lot in there on do's and don'ts and things we like, things we don't like. So if we've got brand assets or, you know, all sorts of stuff that, you know, might you might not necessarily always think about from a from a, from a website brief perspective, but, you know, from a, from a different perspective as, as the most important marketing tool for your business, you know, you start to think a little bit differently, a little bit more commercially, a little bit more psychologically about how this tool can be to best use 